Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the CMCC webinar. Um, today we have a very special uh, speaker, uh, Professor Jean Song von Storch, uh, professor at the University of Hamburg and senior scientist at Max Planck Institute of Meteorology. Um, I will introduce her a little bit later. Uh, first, let me um, tell you a little bit more about the CMCC. Uh, mission of CMCC is to investigate and model the climate system and its interaction with society uh, for sustainable growth, protection of the environment, and the development of science-driven adaptation and mit mitigation policies. The CMCC is organized in seven offices uh, with different science divisions. So science division, research divisions are many. Um, just wanted to um, outline that we have an advanced scientific computing division uh, for uh, the HPC related to uh, climate science. And then we have uh, climate simulations and predictions, ocean modeling, data simulation, ocean prediction applications that today's talk is mostly related to. Topics of very large interest are uh, hopefully uh, solving inequalities and how these inequalities shape our interaction with the climate system, uh, the future Earth uh, and its components. Um, we uh, value very much uh, communication strategy that will uh, um, bring together scientists from all over the world to talk about uh, climate issues and um, so this is part of such events um, and there are also some educational uh, um, nice uh, activities uh, from CMCC you can find on the web space. So let me conclude uh, this part by saying that we have a question and answer session at the end of the talk and uh, in order to participate uh, uh, please use uh, the questions tab on the GoToWebinar control panel on your right. Please locate the uh, questions tab and put them there. I will read them and then I will ask uh, Dr. Professor Jean Song von Storch to answer your questions. Okay, uh, the next webinars um our um, urban adaptation it will be on june 3rd and that's it for the time being um my last uh, few points is to introduce you a little bit more the um jean song uh, she has been at max planck institute in hamburg since 2004 uh, she was before that a graduate student there working on El Nino. And now she is uh, head of the Ocean Statistics Division, a deputy director uh, with Professor Marotsky of the Ocean Group at the Max Planck Institute. And uh, she recent, recently became professor at Hamburg University. So it is my pleasure again to leave the floor to Professor Dr. Jean Song von Storch. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Thanks for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to um, talk about uh, our recent work on internal tides, the generation of internal tide in um, storm tide, uh, storm tide two. That's a, um, a model simulation with 10 degrees um, resolution. So my um, talk will be um, will have two parts. The, in the first part, um, that will be concentrating more on the understanding, and in particular, how to, to how to um, accurately estimate internal tide generation. So basically, that's the starting point. When I when we start with this topic, we found that there. Uh, a huge literature inside on that topic and but there 
quite a few issues which is not um, so clear to me at least to us and the second part is then on the uh, internal tide generation in storm type 2 as i said that's um, based on uh, max planck institute ocean model at 10 degree resolution and um, uh, is driven by the full uh, luni solar tidal potential and with six hourly NSAC forcing. So starting with the first part, um, there are, actually there are two concepts on internal tide generation. And um, um, one is um, based on work done by form drag. And this starts from uh, actually from the um, internal wave community, starting uh, by the paper by Bill in 1975. So actually, there are two papers. And um, there it said that the internal tide generation, the, I put it here as a P, capital P, can be expressed as um, um, a form drag. So this uh, Pi minus D is the internal tide pressure at the bottom. Z equals minus D. D is the bottom height. Um, and then um, D is the, the topography, so the gradient of that. And so this quantity in the brackets, if you integrate over area, that gives you the form drag, the pressure on the two different sides of the um, obstacle. And that together with the um, in pumping, uh, incoming uh, biotropic tides, that is capital U, that produce the work um, and generates internal tides. So this is one way of thinking. And the other way is um, using a energetic consideration. And in that consideration, um, you consider the biotropic energy, actually you consider two systems. One is biotropic motion and the other is bioclinic motion. And you formulate the energetic energy balance for these two. And then you figure out that there is a conversion between biotropic and bioclinic motion. And this conversion, I call it C here, is used to quantify the internal tide generation. And here you see completely different quantities um, appears. These uh, over bar indicate vertical integral, goes from minus D to eta, the C free surface. And then uh, this uh, row prime is the internal tide density. And then um, the capital, um, w is a vertical velo velocity which together with the biotropic tide satisfies the um, divergent free condition. So you see that uh, this is a two different concepts. On the one hand side, the left, you deal with um, the properties at the bottom. On the, on the right, you have a vertically integrated quantity. And also the left hand side is mostly used by the internal wave community and the right hand side mostly by numerical modelers. They quantify this but normally using model data. That's the situation now um, we had and it was not clear at least to us um, which one is more accurate or whether they are identical or not. And then there's another issue. Um, Another issue that you see that in the um, expression of um, uh, expressing the work done by internal tide form drag, there you see this PI, the internal tide pressure. The thing is that if you want to quantify internal tide generation using the form drag, you need to know how to determine this pressure related to internal tide. So they are generally different, two different ways to do that. One is uh, more clean, I say, because these are using semi-analytical solutions. So these are solution of internal waves. In that way, the solution is, if you get it, then that's the internal tide pressure. You identify them quite 
quite um, uh, clearly. However, in this, uh, in this case, you need to make some assumptions in order to get the solutions. And the other possibility, sorry, the other possibility is that you have, th this is the, the case you normally face when you work with observations or with simulations, that you have only the full pressure and you need to decompose the full pressure into a biotropic component and the bioclinic component and, and the bioclinic should be related to the internal tide. And this is well-known problem and there are different ways to do so. And um, there's a paper uh, by Kelly and Al, they summarize actually five different decompositions. Um, and what they do is they all write the five different compositions in one, one common form, namely that the biotropic pressure um, is consists of this capital P, that's the depth averaged pressure, plus um, a term, say P hat, and the bioclinic is the deviation from the depth average, this is given here, and then um, minus P hat, so that if you add the biotropic and bioclinic together, the P hat cancelled out, so it doesn't matter. And they found, they summarized five different ways to express P hat. So there are five ways to specify P hat. And the most common, commonly used way is to set P hat equal zero. And this has been used widely for in the observational community. And Kelly et al, however, conclude that um, this is uh, quoted here, that this method pr provides physical inter interpretable um, conversion, um, biotropic to bioclinic conversion, but contains an error. And, um, and then they further continue, they, they, they found that actually internal tide generation is um, described by this P term, this work done by form drag. However, this, um, for this form drag, the internal tide pressure has to be um, P prime, the deviation from the depth average, minus a p hat and this p hat is a horizontally varying quantity that is due to the free surface movement this is all quite confusing we found and in particular we have the result and the we have two different results one is saying that internal tide generation is given by capital p this due to form drag and the other says is due to uh, is determined by the energy conversion, and both are derived from an energetic consideration. So the the question is why they have end up with two different expressions, and the answer to that is that um, you get different results if you are not careful about how you're decomposing the motions. And um, in both cases, they decompose a horizontal velocity in the same way. So the, bio, the tides are the biotropic velocity and internal tides are the deviation from the horizontal biotropic velocity for the horizontal velocity. But um, the Kelly and our paper in that paper, they, are, they were not so careful about how to decompose the vertical velocity. And that makes difference. And the, uh, if you decompose the vertical velocity into a capital W and a W prime uh, in the way that the full vertical velocity satisfies the uh, free of conversion and also the upper and lower boundary condition, um, then you get a result that the, the int, uh, internal tide generation should be the energy conversion C rather than P. And so the outcome of the energy of an energy consideration depends on the decomposition of W. And uh, here I've just put it on the, for the capital W, it must satisfy this free of diversion and also the lower and upper boundary condition. And these conditions are important because the energy consideration has to be made by integrating the, um, uh, 
energy equation for the whole water column because otherwise you cannot compare biotropic energy with bioclinic energy. You have to integrate them. And if you do integration, the boundary conditions are important. And if you use different boundary conditions, you'll get different results. Okay, and then we still have the problem with the PI, the internal tide pressure. How to determine that? So in our case, we use, we have, if we want to clarify that, we have to start with the decomposition of density. The density is uh, consists of a reference density, rho zero, and then um, time independent background density. The B here is for um, background because we're dealing with a model which simulates both circulation and tide and internal tides. And um, so this um, background indicates the mean circulate, uh, mean the density related to the mean circulation. And then we have everything which time varying, we put it in the row prime. And then with this decomposition of density, you have the decomposition of the pressure, the um, using the hydrostatic relation. And in particular, you have a pressure related to the background density and a pressure P star related to the time varying density. And in this uh, decomposition, clearly this P star should be active for all kinds of motion, not only biotropic and but also bioclinic. So to say that um, it must determine the full horizontal velocity. So if you decompose then the velocity, horizontal velocity into a biotropic depth averaged um, and a bioclinic velocity, then you see that the the um, what's coming up is that you have for the biotropic part, it's in that equation you have the horizontal gradient of the depth averaged uh, pressure, that's a capital P. Um, and in the bioclinic velocity, you have the bioclinic pressure. And then you have the term which are looks the same but with opposite sign. And these terms are related only with the boundary um, conditions and uh, properties. These are the coupling terms which couple the biotropic to the bioclinic motion. And um, so that, and if you are away from the boundary where the, uh, where the coupling terms are not so um, uh, important, you end up with the internal tide pressure is basically the deviation from the depth average. And there's no room for any additional um, horizontally varying um, P hat. And this is what's shown in the in this diagram, which basically shows the uh, rate of change of horizontal uh, velocity related to bioclinic velocity, actually including the Coriolis, and versus the pressure gradient at 110 about 110 meter. And you see that there's quite perfect relation that um, it leaves no room for addi additional pressure or P hat term to add into that. So to say that we think the internal tide pressure inside, uh, away from the boundary is simply the um, deviation from the depth average. And then um, we still have the problem, how is this two, way, two concepts related to each other? And if you think about what how C is calculated. C is calculated through vertical integral. And that means that describes the energy conversion throughout the whole water column. That means it could be not, it, in, it include not only the generation at the bottom, but could also be anywhere in the water column. And actually what happens that is that you have two um, generation terms. One is the form drag at the bottom, this is C bottom, and the other is related to the form drag at the surface. And the part at the bottom, that is identical to the P. And the other part is 
than related to the surface elevation and the form drag related to that. We will see, at least in our model, this is a small term, but it was important for, for us to understand how these two things are related. So that's, um, I guess, that's the first part. And then moving to the second part, that's about our model simulation, storm type two. The first question um, I want to address here is, is the form drag, bottom form drag at work? in storm type two, because the, in all these internal type generation, if you consider the model, in particular using global models, normally people consider only the conversion terms, energy conversion, um, then look at the, whether this form drag is at work. And therefore we want to know whether that is, is the case. And we do that by showing this diagram. And this is the snapshots of internal tide pressure at the bottom. That's the bottom pressure related to internal tide. That's in color. And the ISO lines are the topography in meter. And the, um, the arrows are the biotropic tides. Um, that's in arrow. And this is in the region over Hawaii uh, Ridge. And, um, and it's a time when the tide is is strong. And what you see here is that the tide is coming from south, maybe southwest in this region, and it's in pumping on the ridge. Here is the ridge. And then what you see is your pressure is on the um, windward side um, is positive, and on the leeward side is negative. You have this systematic systematic drop of pressure from the windward to the leeward side. And this is a clear indication that the bottom form drag is at work here, at least um, um, yeah, in this model. And we actually checked different uh, ranges and we see similar, very systematic similar pictures. Okay, and the other thing I want to talk about in, in, uh, in uh, storm type two is the generation over ridges and rises um, versus generation over trenches and droughts. And um, normally people, in particular, if you consider, uh, consider semi-analytical solution using, and this is done in Fourier space, and the, there's no difference between ridges and, and, and trenches. And um, what we see is there is a difference and uh, I show you here on the, on the left are the plots related to the Hawaii range. And then to the right, these three um, narrow um, um, plots are showing the plots over um, Emperor Rough Trough. And this is in the North Pacific. And, uh, and then for each plot, I have the um, the topography at the top, and then we have um, the biotropic tide, and then the uh, generation, that's the P term. Um, um, and then what you see here is that, um, again, the, the topography, uh, the, uh, the contours is the, the topography uh, in, in beta. And you see, uh, what you see is that over the ridge, the biotropic tides, um, can become about one order of magnitude stronger than um, at the sum summit compared to at the foot of the ranges. And um, here the red colors is, uh, has the amplitude of about 30 centimeters per second. And if you're down the hill and at the bottom of the ridge, you have something like three uh, centimeter per second. So you, the biotropic velocity can can be can be one order of magnitude um, stronger within the, in the distance less than hundred kilometer. And um, you see the the bottom generate uh, bottom diagram shows the left shows the generation and this is the large generation is in the area close to the summit. And if you look at the um, situation over emperor uh, trough, you'll see the trough here indicated by ET. 
um, here in the topographic feature uh, uh, plot. And then the velocity here you see is that um, actually you have a much weaker biotropic velocity. And along with that, you have very weak generation. And actually the small, um, and my screen is, the small red colors are related to the, to the small rises here. So um, in other words, you only have significant generation over ridges and rises. There's no, at least in that model, um, generation um, over trenches and troughs. And this is a feature, uh, sorry. Yeah, we can ask why is that so? Uh, certainly that is what we observe in the model. And it could be that the model used is maybe not perfect, um, has problem to generate things in the trenches. And, uh, and for instance, we have only primitive equations and we have only um, very limited resolution. And some of these trenches are very narrow, um, something like 10 kilometers wide. Or, yeah, so you can argue. But, um, uh, but we do see that there's a consistent um, th there's a consistency with the generation mechanism because we see the generation, if that is due to the work done by the pressure, uh, pressure form drag, then you see that this generation should be proportional to the biotropic tide. And actually it is also proportional to the internal bottom pressure internal uh, tide bottom pressure. And this is also a quantity proportional to the biotropic tide. And therefore you have something like um, the generation should be proportional to basically square of the internal uh, uh, biotropic tide magnitude and over trenches because the, the, if the water depth is getting higher, you cannot get strong biotropic tides. That's just as simple as that. The, you have strong tides if the water column getting shallower. And so that in that sense, uh, it's consistent that it is, we have low generation or weak generation of trenches and troughs. Okay, so that's the second feature. And then I want to come to the horizontal distribution and vertical distribution of the generation. And the horizontal generation is actually something widely studied, um, although, um, Nevertheless, I think there's uh, some interesting features here also in the storm tide two model. Here I show you the global map of the generation and the vertical integral of that is gives us 0.7 terawatts. Uh, watts. And uh, you see this picture is actually, um, you, that reminds you probably uh, from other studies which pr produce similar features. But if you look closely, this figure um, is extremely localized, shows extremely localized the strong generation near the summits of ridges and rises. And um, we can take a closer look, look. And this is the region over Hawaii Ridge with um, the, uh, with, with the uh, Nika Ridge, this is this little thing there. And um, two of these plots you have seen before, the um, generation plot here on the left and the biotropic velocity to the right. And then I add to that the um, gradient of the bottom topography. And what I want to point out is if you look at the maximum of bottom the gradient of bottom topography, which is has a much larger scale relative to the, in the sense that is circular, uh, is around summits. And um, the high value of generation is more close to the summits. So this is a logical because the gradient is higher on the slopes. However, this strong generation is not really located at the slopes. It's more located, tends towards the summits where you have strong biotropic tides. So I will say that the control of the generation magnitude is more strongly related to the biotropic tide than by the 
um, gradient of bottom topography. And this can be also clearly seen by the ridge here, uh, the nickel ridge. And here you have very high gradient, but the botropic tides is very, very weak because this is a, a ridge which is much uh, located in the much um, deeper uh, um, um, deep um, uh, part of the ocean. And therefore the generation is much smaller. So it points to the, um, um, the at least in these local considerations, it looks like that the biotropic tides has a stronger control than the topographic features. And if you look at globally, it is also true. So the, what you have here is the, again, the generation picture you showed before. And now I will show you here the um, gradient of the, uh, of the topography. I want to point out that if you look at the southern part of the Indian Ocean, and you see that you have strong gradients there but you don't have any significant generation. And this is because that the biotropic tides are very weak there. And you see that uh, the biotropic tides here is, is uh, much weaker than in the over the ridges and, and rises here in the Pacific. And also another feature, we'll come back to that later, is, is the um, that the biotropic tide is much stronger in Atlantic than in Pacific. And, um, and, uh, and related to that is that the um, internal tide pressure is also very weak in the southern part of um, Indian Ocean and the Pacific. So, um, so, so in other words, um, the, if you look at it from, from the global point of view, strong generation is um, also more strongly controlled by the biotropic type amplitude than by the gradient of the topography. And this is, as I said before, is simply because this work done by form drag is proportional to the magnitude of the biotropic type and the internal tide pressure, bottom pressure, and this quantity is also proportional to internal, uh, to, to biotropic tides. So basically, you have the squared of the biotropic tide into that. Certainly, the gradient of topography also plays a role, but the, the biotropic tides plays a stronger role, larger role, I will say. Okay, the last part um, is about vertical structure, and this is something which is not so obvious and is not, um, at least I didn't find too much on that. And what we did here is we just integrate over the generation, over all generations which happen at the same depths. So we produce the generation as function of depths. And the picture is normalized uh, by the area of the ocean. So that makes them comparable. And what you see, the black line is the generation profile in, for the global ocean. And, um, and the red is for the Indo-Pacific and the blue for the Atlantic. And what you see here, interestingly, in the At Atlantic, you have a maximum at 3000 meter depths. And in the Pacific, you have it, uh, the maximum is at about 500 meter. So it's a very different um, gener uh, uh, location of the uh, source of internal tides. If we think that internal tides is an important source for the mixing, internal mixing, then um, that will provide energy for overturn. Then it seems to indicate that the Atlantic can be heated from below, but the Pacific, Indo-Pacific is more heated from above. That's an interesting thing, I think, to, to look further into, to, to understand how that controls the overturning in the sense that in the Atlantic, you have this AMOC uh, Atlantic overturning, which goes in the different direction as the overturning in the Pacific Ocean. And here, the, the fact that you have this maximum, deep maximum in the Atlantic is related also to the fact I said before that the biotropic tide 
is very strong in the Atlantic compared to that in the Pacific. And in the Atlantic, the, the topographic feature are located at much deeper um, part of the ocean. In the much deeper part of the ocean, this mid-Atlantic range um, is around um, to uh, two to three thousand meter depths, and because the biotropic tides is much stronger in the Atlantic, you can uh, still have significant generation there, and um, produce this different structure. And in the Pacific, um, the large generation are mainly you have very very large generation values in terms of the magnitude, but they are all around summits of the ridges and rises, and they are all, yeah, uh, um, pretty shallow. And therefore, you have this different structure. Okay, that's um, the main message I want to talk about. And the, to conclude, the um, for the first part, um, the I. Uh, the first thing is to say that energetic consideration, um, that the outcome of that depends on how you decompose vertical velocity. You, has to be, you, you need to be careful. You need to not only consider the horizontal decomposition, you have to do it right also for the vertical and, and, and also to, to do it right, rightly for the uh, boundary conditions because the energy consideration is a consideration through for the whole water cover. Uh, um, and then the second part is to say that um, the, um, the C term and P term, the, these two concepts of internal tide generation, they are closely linked to each other and the energy conversion contains actually both the work done by the bottom form drag and the work done by the surface form drag. And only the lower part, the bottom form drag part, is um, identical to the P um, introduced, uh, studied by, by all these internal uh, wave people. And then the other point is the internal tide pressure. And we uh, we show that this should be related to the um, deviation of the depth average. And then to the um, internal tide generation in, in, in storm tide two, um, first point, bottom form drag is at work that generates the um, in, uh, internal tide in storm tide two. And then the second point, um, the P term is we show that is the generation is more directly controlled by the magnitude of biotropic tide. And that leads to extremely localized horizontal distribution of internal tide generation. And this is an issue that becomes also more clearly if you have a high resolution model, like 10 degrees over uh, 10 degrees. Um, because if you have something half degree or whatever, then you, you cannot really resolve these um, areas with very, um, with um, uh, where the water column depths change uh, dramatically over short distance. You don't see these changes of the biotropic tide uh, clearly. And uh, so that's the second point. And then uh, at least in, Storm tide two trenches and troughs does not play the same role as as ridges and rises, and um, and then uh, we saw the vertical distribution that the strongest internal tide generation is located at about three kilometers in the Atlantic, but at about five hundred meter in Indo Pacific, and finally I um, the global integral of the generation in the model for the M2 is 0 0.2, 0 0.7 terawatts. And then interesting, everybody want to know how big is the work done by surface form drag? That's at least in this model, only about 1% of, um, of that by bottom form drag. Yeah, that's it. And um, before I take questions, and this is the movie, about um, internal tight um, bottom pressure. Um, and um, yeah, and here you see not only the generation size, but also 
um, how the internal tide propagates away uh, from the generation sites. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jin Song. This was very interesting. We have a few questions. And uh, I'll ask uh, everybody uh, to first enter the questions in the um, panel, and then I will uh, read them and ask uh, uh, Jin Song to answer. Um, so we have a first one um, that ask about what is the meaning of negative internal tide generation energy? Do you make a sum of positive and negative to get the total internal tide generation? Um, well, um, the number we get the global integral, that's the integral over the um, total area that includes probably also negative values. But if you look um, carefully, the, the negative value, for instance, here in this plot, uh, here over Hawaii range, that's, um, it's really, um, yeah, um, it's very small. The so, most, mo yeah, the, the uh, most, over most regions, the um, notable large values are positive. So we don't have really big negative values, but we do have some negative, um, small negative values. Um, it's difficult to tell to what extent, um, yeah, that is a numerical issue or not. That's, I cannot say right now. Thank you. And then we have uh, another one about uh, the uh, substantial abyssal overturning in the Pacific. Uh, so the existence of a substantial abyssal, abyssal overturning in the Pacific, but not in the Atlantic, requires the abyssal mixing in the Pacific. Maybe is this mixing not generated by tides? Yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something I cannot say. This, this is just, uh, I just found it amazing that uh, the distribution is so different in these two cases. And I have to say, this is only M2. Um, Although we would think that M2 will make the big major part, um, but um, I think we, that's, there are more we can do and to learn in that direction. And um, yeah, that's all I can say right now. Thank you, Jin Song. We have another one here, uh, which is thanking you for a very interesting presentation. And then he's asking how smooth the bottom topography should be for a semi-analytical solution you were mentioning at the beginning to be valid. What is the characteristic length scale from theoretical oh, standpoint? Yeah, they, they basically, I, I think, I, yeah, they basically make two assumptions. One is a weak topography. And the other is a small vertical uh, tidal excursion, and that means small relative to the to the um, uh, length scale of the topography. So the, basically, it's saying that the, that semi-analytical sol solution works only well for subcritical conditions, but not for super conditional um, critical conditions, and. The, I think the um, normally people will say that if you want to include all conditions, you should, um, yeah, you should not use the semi-analytical solution, but to consider the uh, really two numerical solutions that can deal with all, yeah, can, yeah, they need to make this type of assumptions. That's okay. my understanding. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I have a question, if I might, uh, before the others. 
is your internal tide energy conversion um, specific to some horizontal flow structures? Is it connected to horizontal flow structure, the internal tide energy conversion part? What do we mean with flow stru structures? Meaning, for example, boundary currents, western boundary currents. Mm -hmm. But um, but uh, the way how we calculate them, the internal tide bottom pressure is that uh, we do harmonic analysis. So these are the variations of pressure which um, are at exactly the tidal frequency. So also in the boundary conditions, uh, uh, boundary current regions, you, you, you could have strong boundary currents, but um, I guess they will not, uh, the current itself will not fluctuate at the, uh, at the tidal frequency. So you, at least from these type of analysis, you have to, you won't see, um, yeah. I don't know whether I, I get you. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. I understand uh, that bar barotropic uh, velocity is not, uh, does not contain uh, the mean flow structure. Modification of the tides. Uh, the about well, the biotropic velocity is as as the bioclinic velocity are always um, 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 uh, uh, analyzed by using this harmonic analysis. So, so, so we consider here only the variations at the tidal frequency. Okay, thank you very much. We have other questions. I just want to go to. Um, between the two approaches of having the energy of tide, um, that is something uh, I cannot. Uh, uh, can Dr. Samo uh, write again the question because I think it's cut. So I go to the next question. In this model study, how results depend on the model vertical resolution and frequency of atmospheric forcing? Hmm. Um, the vertical resolution is 40 levels, so it's not very high. And uh, certainly uh, that means, well, together with horizontal resolution, that means you, you can not resolve um, too much high mode, modes of internal tides. And we have other studies, Zhuhua did that, um, um, showing that um, basically for M2, we can resolve um, mode one and two basically. And for K1, we can resolve a bit more because K1 has somewhat larger scales. So we can probably also resolve uh, mode three. And um, so if you have limited resolution, both in the vertical and horizontal, you won't um, get enough um, high modes. So that's that's um, that's for sure. But on the other hand, we know also from observational studies that um, um, the most of the um, 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 internal tide energy flux are related to the low modes. The, yeah, there are also studies um, the, uh, uh, showing that high modes uh, plays a role, but um, if you have low resolution, you, you don't resolve them. Okay, thank you very much. I actually understood the question that I couldn't understand before. So um, we are asking which methodology is more usable, P or C? As I said, um, <laughs> um, I guess C is more easier to use because you don't need to identify internal tight bottom pressure. This is something then you need to argue, yeah, to get from the full pressure to isolate from the full pressure the part related to the internal tide. And um, therefore, mostly 
numerical modeling people, they use this uh, C term. And at least from our model result, it shows that the form drag at the surface does not play too much role. So it basically C is about P and uh, the difference is very little. So, Great. Um, yeah, thank you. It's just more, yeah, it's more for our, for at least for our understanding. Yes, so uh, another question is how much uh, should the IT, uh, the internal tide generation, affect the parameterization of the vertical diffusive coefficient? I guess in coarser resolution models, I mean. Um. I cannot say, I will say that once, once the waves are generated, I will say that certainly the parameterizations in the model will affect the propagation of the waves. And we have some indication that um, the propagation of the waves may not be as the, in the observations. Um, but the generation itself, um, I don't quite see um, uh, the direct control or effect of parameterization on the generation itself because that is um, controlled by the topography that's given and by the biotropic tide that if you have the tidal potential in there, if you do it correctly, you have, the, you have it also. Um, and then um, the, the way how the, the internal tide pressure, well, that, uh, okay, that is related to the density and, uh, well, maybe that through that door, the, um, the diffusion process and, and uh, the apicno mixing could affect the density and then through that the pressure and, um, but that, that, that won't be a direct effect. But Thank I you, no Elena. <laughs> I guess we have the last one. We don't want to exhaust you, but we had so many questions here. Um, your model is called the Storm Tide 2. Does the storm indicate the ability of the model to simulate storm surges? Oh, no, that was it. It was it. Housing started with a German consulting project. Um, uh, trying to do high resolution uh, simulations and we started with storm and this that was a 10th degree ocean model simulation and there there was no tide and then we add the tide that was storm tide but that um, in that case we have a very simple um, uh, forcing at the surface actually using restoring temperature and salinity and that then a bit the internal uh, tight motions and, and and now in storm tide 2 we use the flux condition at the surface and that somehow improves the propagation of the internal tides so that's the two wise wise two very good so i guess it's time to close and we should thank again uh, uh jin song for the most interesting seminar and we hope to have you soon uh, to show us maybe the real uh, storm surge capabilities of this model <laughs> for practical application. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. And thanks uh, all the, the audience uh, for the questions. The audience is also thanking you, as you can see. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Good evening to everybody from this part of the world, otherwise uh, good afternoon and good morning.